Hello, everybody. It's good to see you again, and uh, always good to see you and uh, be with uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord and to continue to grow in Him and uh, keep learning and keep going forward. And, of course, as we do that, we got to pray for boldness and courage and strength and uh, that uh, we be reminded of His Word. And uh, what we're going through is the book of Isaiah, which... Man, the book of Isaiah is fantastic because, uh, well, the section we're in now is that second half of the book, the book of comfort, and starting at 40. So it's divided into uh, 40 through 48, and it's uh, uh, and then uh, 49 through 57, and then 58 through 66. So we're looking at those three sections, and... Well, we're dealing with uh, a servant, Jesus' servant, uh, on the section we're dealing with today, which is the second part, which is 49 through 57. But we're going to have to take it by just bites and chunks because it uh, there's so much there. And what we're looking at is the salvation of God. God so clearly shows his salvation to his remnant. Now, of course... There's that Israel that he was dealing with, and the enemies that they have been dealing with have been Assyria and Babylon. But really, that's not the only enemies that they're dealing with. Really, the enemy is their selves towards God. But there's always a faithful that God's looking after, and God is doing something about having a, a heavenly Zion that, that he can rescue his people and bring them to. And not only is he looking for those faithful that were part of that people, the Hebrews called the Jews, the faithful there, but also the faithful through the rest of the whole world because he did make everybody. There's not anybody in the whole world that he hasn't made, but there's only those that are going to turn to him that are going to have life together as a family. If you notice, the, the kingdom of uh, Israel has been divided, the north being ten tribes, and they've been taken out by the Assyrians. And they had come down towards the south to try to take out Judah also. And God did save them at that time. He saved Judah from the Assyrians. But it's shown how the Babylonians would come and overtake him, destroy the, the city and the temple. And you can see the uh, book of Isaiah, how 1 through 39 was dealing with judgment, 40 through 66, comfort. And you can see how we went through those first seven sections of the first division. And now in this second division, we've got 40 through 48, the maker and deliverer, and we're dealing with uh, Cyrus. And then this section that we're dealing with is 49 through 57, Messiah the servant. And we really see his salvation. And then uh, later will be 58 through 66, the king in his reign. And we were looking at servant songs. We we went through one servant song, which was chapter 42. But now we've got 49, then 50, and then uh, last part of 52, and then 53 is servant songs. Now, Israel, it's a servant chosen by God, and that's before Christ's coming. But of course, this is showing Christ the servant. Now, Israel was disobedient, and they were unfruitful except for the remnant. And so God is calling his remnant, and you will know them by their fruits. So here we see this new servant being raised up, Christ, really, the Messiah. And he's redeeming the old Israel, and then it extends clear off into all the Gentiles. So you can kind of see, like, if you look at Jesus, he is the one that redeems all people. And... He is the one that is faithful, the one that is true, and the one who, well, Psalms 2, all the earth is his, and he inherits the nations. And so he is the one to look at. You know, you can't look back at physical Israel or physical Jew, or anything like that. Even the physical Jews, even as much as you would be a teacher, Paul was a Pharisee, which is a, a teacher and instructor in the law, but he had blinders on his eyes until he could see through Christ. And that's when he turned to Christ. He uh, 
he threw all that other stuff away as dung for the truth of Christ and uh, him crucified and continued to teach. So the one who really has the land is Jesus. And he's the only one who qualifies to have it. And it says the meek will inherit the earth. So all those that are in Christ, they are the ones who have the land. But the regular earthly Zion, no, that thing did not work. In fact, they will never have a peace. Uh, The only way you can have peace is turn into God and what he's provided through the Prince of Peace, and that would be Jesus Christ. So the Zion above, the heavenly Zion, that's what Abraham was looking forward, and we'll see that in these sections. Okay, Isaiah 49, raise up, restore light and salvation, the faithful servant Jesus Christ. You should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Listen, O coastlands, to me, and take heed, you people from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb. From the matrix of my mother, he has made mention of my name. And he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver, he has hidden me. And he said to me, you are my servant. O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet surely my just reward is with the Lord and my work with my God. Well, you know, the natural Israel, if they wanted to take the place of Christ, they could start standing up like they're the servant and people could be propping natural Israel like like they are serving God and part of God. But now there's no part of God unless you are in the seed that is Christ. And that's very clear by Paul and Peter and the other apostles. Now, looking at this sword coming out of the mouth, uh, it makes me think of Revelations 19.11. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Well, this is the Lord of hosts, and we'll see in uh, Isaiah that you shall know his name, and his name is the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. Ephesians 6, speaking of a sword, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And of course, Paul, yeah, he uh, definitely had a, a sword coming out of his mouth, the truth that he was speaking. Back to Isaiah 49, 5. And now the Lord says, Who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, so that Israel is gathered to him. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Indeed, he says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles, 
that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Well, isn't that great that he uh, is not only to those, the remnant that he's speaking to, but to the rest of the world. And Paul, of course, shows us what, what Isaiah is talking about. And Isaiah, of course, is 700 years before Christ. And then 700 years later, Paul shows us what exactly he's talking about. So let's look at Acts 13, 44. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, but since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. And then we'll go farther and we can see how the Jews are persecuting the believers. And of course, Paul, he believes Moses and he believes the prophets where these others don't. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city, and then they raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and they expelled them from the region. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy with the Holy Spirit. They stir up all the prominent, and uh, some of them were women, but it sure reminds you of the time we're in, doesn't it? Of course, all times since Christ have been like that. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, to him whom man despises, to him whom the nation abhors, to the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship, because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, and he has chosen you. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people, they didn't receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And back to Isaiah. In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people, to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages that you may say to the prisoners, Go forth to those who are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed along the roads, and their pastures shall be on all the desolate heights. So, of course, Isaiah is speaking in the time of Jesus and the apostles. And God is their provision, and he's providing for them along the road as they are going forth preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. God is providing for them, and he's feeding him. Uh, remember Jesus, he said, you have, uh, he has food that they don't know of. And uh, it was to continue doing the work of his father. Okay, 2 Corinthians 6. Let's look at that. We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed, but in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God, not servants, in much patience, in tribulation, in need, in distress, in stripes, imprisonment, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings, by purity. Well, that's a great one, isn't it? That's a good thought for us to continue being pure by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold, we live as chastened and yet not killed as sorrowful yet always rejoicing as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Look, you have the Holy Spirit, and uh, you can hear this word, and you know what they're going through, and uh, let that be a help to you. And if you do not have the Holy Spirit, 
and uh, the power of God to walk boldly forth like the apostles were, then pray to the Holy Spirit, pray to God for the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. And, you know, he's a good father. It's not like when you're praying, if you were asked, well, after, actually, if you were just asking your own earthly father, it said for a bread, he's not going to give you a snake. So you can ask fa- your father, God, and he will give you uh, greater things than any man will do. So you need the Holy Spirit. All right, back to Isaiah 49:10. They shall neither hunger nor thirst. Yeah, remember like on the roadway there. Neither heat nor sun shall strike them. For he who has mercy on them will lead them. Even by the springs of water he will guide them. I will make each of my mountains a road, and my highways shall be elevated. Surely these shall come from afar. Look, those from the north and the west, and these from the land of Sinim. Well, we've got all these Gentiles coming in. Let's look at Revelation 7, 16. They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. You know, they need an elevated road because this is not on an earthly plane. This is not just some road over in Israel where you're going to go and have peace and salvation. No. They'll never have peace. But what we have is that heavenly Zion above, and this roadway is above the mountains here. Luke 13, 22, enter the narrow gate. The master of the house shuts the door. And he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, as I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you, where you are from. Then you will begin to say, Well, we ate and we drank in your presence, and you taught us in the streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you, and where you are from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out. They will come from the east and the west and the north and the south and sit down in the kingdom of God. And indeed, there are last who will be first and there are first who will be last. And in Revelation 7, 9, you see a great multitude before the Lamb uh, and God on the throne. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, and the elders, and the four living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing, and glory, and wisdom. Thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And back to Isaiah 49, 13. Sing, O heavens, be joyful, O earth, and break out in singing, O mountains. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have mercy on his afflicted. But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me, and my Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Psalms 22, 16 For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They looked and stared at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. 
Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. You have answered me. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. Your sons shall make haste. Your destroyers and those who laid waste shall go away from you. Lift up your eyes, look around and see. All these gather together and come to you. As I live, says the Lord, you shall surely clothe yourselves with them as an ornament and bind them on you as a bride does. For your waste and desolate places and the land of your destruction will even now be too small for the inhabitants and those who swallowed you up will be far away. So isn't that something that what they have, it's too small for the constraints of what God has with his kingdom. He's got a great thing in the kingdom of God and heavenly Jerusalem and heavenly Zion. The children you will have after you have lost the others will say again in your ears, the place is too small for me. Give me a place where I may dwell. Then you will say in your heart, who has begotten these for me since I have lost my children and am desolate, a captive and wandering to and fro? And who has brought these up? There I was left alone. But these, where were they? Yeah, think about that. When Jesus was going to the cross, he said, Your house has been left to you desolate. See, and when you see that in, in the Old Testament, of course, um, well, you see him here, Isaiah is speaking, but later Babylon comes and destroys them. They've been left desolate, and then the uh, Jerusalem and the temple are totally destroyed. And that's the same thing that happened with Jesus when he was there, that 40 years later, they were surrounded and the, the city and the temple were utterly destroyed. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will lift my hand in an oath to the nations and set up my standard for the peoples. They shall bring your sons in their arms and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. Kings shall be your foster fathers and their queens your nursing mothers. They shall bow down to you with their faces to the earth and lick up the dust of your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed who wait for me. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty or the captives of the righteous be delivered? 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light who once were not a people but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. Well, we can tell who uh, Peter thinks are the people of God, and that's those people that have turned to Christ. We know that. And uh, let's look at this one with a woman, Luke seven thirty seven. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head, and she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, he'd know who and what manner of woman this who is is touching him, for she's a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, Teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, well, I suppose the one who forgave more. And he said to him, You have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. There's another thing here that I like that is uh, 
Paul speaking in Galatians 4. And what we see here is two sons, two covenants, a bondwoman of flesh and a free woman of promise. You got Mount Sinai, the Jerusalem, which now is in bondage with her children. So that's a natural Jerusalem is in bondage. And they are persecutors also, and they aren't heirs. But that Jerusalem above, that is free, the mother of us all. They're heirs, the children of promise, according to the Spirit. And we are the ones who proclaim the gospel of Christ, the good news of the kingdom of God. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise. Which things are symbolic? For these are two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now we brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Now let's go back to 4925 of Isaiah. But thus says the Lord, Even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible be delivered. For I will contend with them who contends with you, and I will save your children. I will feed those who oppress you with their own flesh, and they shall be drunk with their own blood, as with sweet wine." All flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. And I think we can end this with uh, what Paul said in Romans 10 here. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who will descend into the abyss. That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth, and in your heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. And if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. And there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. All this is close to you, like Isaiah said. And all we have to do is turn to Jesus, that he gave his life down and took our sins upon it so they could all be wiped out, so that we could be, even though our sin was like scarlet, it could be washed clean, white as snow, white as wool and that uh, we can be following him and uh, where he is, we can be also through Christ. And uh, I just pray that you uh, have boldness to speak the truth in the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit so others can hear the truth and see Christ lifted up and be saved and turn from the power of darkness to the power of light in the kingdom of God. Amen, and God bless you.